For centuries, stories about fish have fascinated those who live near the lakes and streams of the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. From ancient Indian myths to the fish stories of modern-day anglers, trout and salmon have captured our imagination. Even today, these legendary fish are providing one of the most unique and intriguing stories in all of nature. Just below the surface of healthy streams and lakes, diverse and complex biological communities thrive. The natural dynamics of these underwater environments, together with the changes caused by the activities of man, have a profound effect on the lives of salmon and trout. Together, they weave a dramatic story of underwater survival, a story that ultimately reaches far beyond the banks of these streams and lakes. The Indians called them kokani, or redfish. Every year, a major spawning run can be seen in late August through mid-October in the beautiful mountain streams of British Columbia. salmon are returning to their native streams from Kootenai Lake. Kokanee are landlocked freshwater sockeye salmon. They spend their native life cycles in lakes and streams. Though they are related to seagoing sockeye salmon that return from the ocean to spawn in freshwater streams, Kokanee are a separate, non-interbreeding species. Kokanee feed on tiny aquatic animals called zooplankton and mysis, a kind of freshwater shrimp. And in the natural progression of the predator-prey relationship, kokanee, in turn, are the main food source for Gerard rainbow trout in many of the large lakes in the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. Soon after kokanee spawn in the streams, they die. But even in death, they continue to serve the ecosystem. Bald eagles and ring-billed gulls feed on the dead and dying kokanee to sustain themselves through part of the winter. The decaying bodies return nutrients and energy to the creeks and lakes. Large populations of kokanee salmon are found in Lake Pend Oreille in northern Idaho. In fact, this abundance of kokanee is the main food source for trophy-sized rainbow trout, or camloops, found there. Oftentimes, a combination of too much fishing, habitat deterioration, and biological competition will reduce the number of reproductive fish in a lake or stream system. Soon, there are fewer young fish, and the entire fish population begins to decline. It then becomes necessary to maintain kokanee populations by restocking lakes with hatchery-raised fish. The Idaho Fish and Game Department has an active kokanee capture program for collecting eggs and milk at Granite Creek. The operation is located on the northeast shore of Lake Pend Oreille. 
The restocking of hatchery raised fish from this program not only helps to maintain the kokanee populations in the lake, but it also provides a good food supply for other game fish. Kokanee eggs and milt are removed, and the artificially fertilized eggs are raised at the fish hatchery. The young kokanee are then reintroduced into the lake to augment natural populations. The Lardo River in British Columbia provides habitat for the largest race of Girard rainbow trout in the world. The Lardo River is the outlet for Trout Lake and flows into Kootenai Lake. The biggest rainbow trout weigh over 35 pounds. Most are in the 20 pound range. They spawn each spring from February through June. The greatest threat to the rainbow population is habitat destruction from improper logging and road construction, subdivisions, hydroelectric development, and stream channelization. All of these contribute silt to the river. Habitat protection and restoration has become the top priority in managing this exceptional fishery. They are one of the most prized trophy fish in the region. But in the U.S., many consider them an endangered species. Bull trout, also known as Dolly Varden, need cold, clean, highly oxygenated waters. Arrow Lake in British Columbia provides one of the finest bull trout populations in the world. In many regions of the Pacific Northwest, bull trout are in decline due to the destruction of their habitat. Game fish like the kokanee, rainbow, and dolly varden are all fighting for survival throughout the Pacific Northwest and Western Canada. To better understand their struggle, we need to understand their natural environments and the complex communities that exist just below the surface of our lakes and streams. Hayden Creek in northern Idaho is an ideal setting to observe the dynamic interactions of a tributary stream and its lake. Here there's an overwhelming abundance and diversity of trout and other organisms that make up complex biological communities. Juvenile cutthroat trout inhabit the plunge pools and swift current in the riffles of the creek. The outlet at Hayden Creek forms a large sand silt delta, which changes its character with the seasons as it merges with Hayden Lake.
The current erodes, carries, and deposits material. Here, fish and aquatic plant communities thrive. In the spring, birds are abundant and active. Male red-winged blackbirds sing to attract a mate and claim a territory. Canadian geese congregate together with their new goslings. The water oozel, or dipper, forages for food. <laughs> Numerous tributaries flow into Hayden Creek and contribute to the rushing water that eventually reaches the lake. Penetrating the water's surface often forms unusual light patterns. Split views above and below the creek illustrate the close-knit relationship of land, air, and water. Many biological and environmental factors play a vital role in maintaining species diversity, stability, and productivity in healthy streams. Pools and riffles are essential for successful trout spawning, rearing, and feeding. Numerous pools in Hayden Creek provide cover and resting habitat for the trout. The variety and number of salmon and trout in any stream are highly dependent on the food supply and the competition for cover, space, and spawning habitat. Protection from predators, as well as shade, is provided by large boulders, deep plunge pools, and overhanging vegetation. are 
essential to stabilize stream banks and reduce erosion. Sediment can smother fish eggs and clog gills, killing both immature and adult fish. and abundance of aquatic insects that trout feed on is also determined by the size and amount of rocks on the stream bottom and on water quality and flow. Immature aquatic insects flourish in Hayden Creek's riffles. These insects are an essential food source for cutthroat, brook, and rainbow trout. Trout feed extensively on organisms carried by the current. The edges of riffles and pools are key areas where drifting insects are found. Trout feed most extensively on invertebrate drift in the spring, on mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. The insect drift is most abundant at dusk, night, and dawn. Trout are opportunistic feeders, eating whatever's available as the stream goes through its seasonal rhythmic changes. Shaded pools are often holding areas for trout. These pools provide cover from predators. This cover is best when shrubs, Trees and other vegetation cover only part of the stream, and some open space is left among the vegetation. Overhanging trees and branches shade the pool and assist in keeping the water cool. The overhanging vegetation also accounts for cooler water in the stream, which allows oxygen to be more soluble at these lower water temperatures. Furthermore, fish consume less oxygen here. Both young and adult fish seek out pools where they can spend less energy swimming than in the strong current of the riffles. Aquatic insects attached to the riffle bottom often break free in the strong currents. These insects either recolonize downstream or are eaten by fish and other predators. Trout also feed on insects which have fallen from overhanging vegetation. The trout face into the current at the riffle and dart out from pools to capture prey. The proximity and abundance of these pools and riffles is critical and is related to the amount of food and cover in any stream. Newly emerged fry, which have hatched from the riffle bottom, seek cover from predators and strong current. Pools, large rocks, and overhanging vegetation provide cover and serve as rearing areas until young fish are able to swim in the strong current. Masses of aquatic plants and filamentous algae harbor organisms for the young fish to feed on. The organisms in these pools are different from those found in riffles. Pollen from conifers and willow trees and seeds from cattails coat the surface of the stream. The surface tension between the air and water 
traps insects and other organisms as well as pollen and seeds. This food, trapped on the surface, is a smorgasbord for both fish and birds. Plant and animal communities must adapt to the changes in depth and width of the stream. Transformations in biological communities throughout the seasons are much more apparent in streams than in lakes. The adjacent wetland, or riparian zone, is also subject to extreme fluctuation in water level and flow. This freshwater clam population thrives in the strong, cool currents of the St. Joe River. The freshwater clams anchor themselves in the stream bottom just below the rushing water where they can filter suspended matter and food. Looking upward, from underneath the surface and a deep pool, you can see a window effect. The window effect appears like a fisheye view. Trees bend into the window, making them appear much closer than they actually are. This window effect is why fish can see you before you can see them. Waterfalls provide oxygen-rich, rushing water where both salmon and trout can thrive. Most of the nutrients and energy in streams originate from outside the stream itself. Heavy rain and snow melt in the spring often account for suspended sediment in streams. Oftentimes, large deltas will form at the outlet. Excellent fishing can be found at these outlets due to the abundance of aquatic organisms, including many species of fish, vertebrates, invertebrates, and aquatic plants. Differences in water temperature, current, color, salinity, and turbidity at stream, lake, and ocean outlets attract predators and prey alike. Fish depend on adequate water flow and depth for successful spawning and rearing. If water levels fluctuate too much, the eggs will not hatch. Proper management of the watershed is essential in order to maintain adequate water quantity and quality in streams and lakes. Nestled in spectacular forests and scenic mountains, Priest Lake is one of the most pristine clearwater lakes in the Pacific Northwest. Over 18 miles long, 4 miles wide, and 370 feet deep, Priest Lake has gone through some major changes over the last century. Historically, it once had abundant bull trout, or Dolly Varden, as well as cutthroat trout. Today, there is no harvest allowed for either species. And lake trout, or Mackinac, is the only sport fish in the lake. The lake trout feed on young fish, including other lake trout, 
whitefish, squawfish, suckers, and forage fish. The reasons for the changes in the fisheries are varied and complex. The story goes something like this. Brook trout were introduced to Priest Lake in the 1920s and provided competition for native fish species. Five years later, lake trout were introduced. Then, 17 years after that, kokanee were introduced and provided food for record-sized lake trout to grow on. Kokanee were fished extensively for 20 years and a record seven-pounder was caught. However, by the late 1970s, kokanee were gone from Priest Lake. What caused this drastic change? It's thought that predation among trout, overfishing, and the introduction of mysis shrimp resulted in the crash of the kokanee population. Mysis shrimp were introduced in the mid-1960s in hopes of providing food for the kokanee to grow on and multiply. Unfortunately, only a few kokanee fed on mysis. However, mysis shrimp competed for the same zooplankton food supply as young kokanee fry, and the survival of these young fry plummeted. The problem was further compounded by the fact that mysis shrimp provided a smorgasbord for the juvenile lake trout in Priest Lake, and consequently, lake trout populations exploded as they fed on young kokanee the kokanee population finally collapsed. With time, all lakes, like Priest Lake, experience change in water quality and biological makeup. Priest Lake has excellent water quality with low phosphorus and low nitrogen levels. High dissolved oxygen can be found at all water depths throughout the year. The water is very clear and the lake has very little algae production. The deep sandy basin and densely forested shoreline help to maintain low nutrient levels in the lake. Variety and makeup of plants in Priest Lake consist of submergent aquatic plants typically found in clear, clean lakes known as oligotrophic lakes. Priest Lake, like most lakes, has successional stages of aquatic plant communities. They are the submergent, floating leaf, and emergent plant communities. As you move away from the lake, you will find zones of plant development, including herbs, shrubs, and trees. This vegetation is eventually replaced by species of plants best adapted to the light, moisture, and soil conditions surrounding the basin. These plants help to stabilize the soils in the watershed. Lakes have distinct associations of plants and animals. As lakes age, a unique association of organisms becomes dominant. Many of these dominant species are known as indicator species, since they are indicative of a set of specific environmental conditions. These biological and environmental communities that interact and change with time make up ecosystems. Limnologists, or freshwater oceanographers, study specific regions of a lake called life zones. These life zones are areas in a lake with characteristic environmental conditions and living organisms. There are four life zones in a lake. One of these, the littoral zone, is the near shore area where light penetrates to the lake bottom and rooted submergent aquatic plants can usually be found.
Another area, the limnetic zone, is the open water area where light is sufficient for phytoplankton populations. Profundal zone is a deep water area below the limnetic zone and is bordered by the deepest limits of the littoral zone. A fourth area, the benthic zone, is at the bottom of the lake and reaches from the shore and throughout the entire lake bottom. Each of these life zones have indicative organisms such as fish and other animals and plants. The preferred life zone for feeding, cover and reproduction by a particular species of fish varies with their age and condition, as well as the light conditions, water temperature and movement. All these variables provide for intriguing speculation and vehement debate about fish behavior and the habitats they prefer. Most species of salmon and trout can be found in all regions of the lake at different times of the year. These cold water fish will feed opportunistically on fish and invertebrates such as zooplankton in the open water and immature aquatic insects living on aquatic plants and the bottom of the lake. Kokanee move from the summer cold water depths of the lake through the near shore areas to complete their fall spawning run upstream. Some species of salmon and trout will spawn in the shallows of a lake if a stream is not available. The makeup of submergent plant communities is closely related to the feeding and movement of warm water game fish. Submergent plants appear to play a lesser role for cold water fish than for warm water fish. However, all fish respond to environmental conditions such as water temperature, dissolved oxygen, light, food, bottom structure, wave action, and currents. In most aquatic communities, submergent plants and phytoplankton carry out photosynthesis, converting sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide to food, energy, oxygen, and water. This basic photochemical and biological reaction provides energy for all other living organisms. Predators, such as fish, birds, and insects, feed on other organisms in the food web. This predator-prey relationship allows for the transfer of energy from one feeding level to another and accounts for the biological diversity and complex food chains that develop in lakes. By understanding who feeds on whom and the way these organisms interact with their environment, we can better manage and protect both fisheries and water quality in our lakes and streams. Bacteria, fungi, and some invertebrates convert once living organisms to nutrients and energy, which is reutilized by other organisms. This recycling of energy among the different feeding levels in food webs is the fundamental basis of ecological relationships.
these interactions account for the stability and diversity of life on our planet. This continuing process sustains life and demonstrates that matter is neither created nor destroyed. Rather, it is changed to a different form and recycled. Lakes go through an aging process called eutrophication. This process is characterized by changes in water chemistry and depth, surface area, species diversity, and biological productivity. As the lake eutrophies, both the water clarity and dissolved oxygen decrease. Increases in phosphate and nitrate nutrients contribute to the excessive growth of aquatic plants and algae that are associated with lake eutrophication. Eutrophication is accelerated by poor watershed management practices. Pollution from municipal or industrial waste discharges, excessive timber harvesting, mining, road building and agricultural activities may contribute toxic materials such as gas and oil, heavy metals, herbicides, pesticides or nutrients. These pollutants cause physical, chemical and biological destruction in lakes, streams and our oceans. Lakes obtain most of their organic matter and energy from within. The lake acts as a nutrient sink, accumulating nutrients and energy. Lake eutrophication is characterized by gradual changes from a younger, deeper, cold water lake to an older lake with less depth, less oxygen, and lower light at the deeper depths. Oligotrophic lakes are low in nutrients and are generally deep, clear, cold water lakes. One of the major distinctions of oligotrophic lakes is that there is adequate dissolved oxygen at all depths all year round for aquatic organisms to survive. Most lakes in the temperate zone turn over or mix completely from top to bottom twice a year. The mixing occurs in the spring and fall. In the spring, the surface water is heated by the sun, resulting in uniform water temperature in the lake. As summer progresses, the warmer surface water stratifies. This upper mass of water, called the epilimnion, has high levels of dissolved oxygen. Here in the epilimnion, millions of small plants called phytoplankton float freely about the lake. These tiny plants, consisting primarily of algae and diatoms, are the primary producers of oxygen and energy in lake systems. Millions of phytoplankton organisms are consumed by small animal plankton called zooplankton. Some species of trout feed extensively on the zooplankton, which migrate vertically upward during the night and downward during the day to avoid sunlight. The abundance and variety of these small animals and plants varies with the water quality and weather conditions, especially light intensity, water temperature, and wave action. Below the epilimnion is the thermocline. The thermocline has extreme changes in water temperature and often is one of the best areas in a lake for catching fish. Many predatory fish can be found in the cooler water of the thermocline, as long as abundant dissolved oxygen and food are available. Below the thermocline is the hypolimnion, that body of deep, cold water near the lake bottom. Here in the hypolimnion, sunlight is limited. These deep waters do not mix with the thermocline or epilimnion during the summer.
In the fall, the shorter day length, accompanied by strong winds, begins to cool the lake. The cooling winds remove heat from the lake's surface until the temperature is the same throughout. This cooling results in the complete mixing of the surface water and deep water, as water temperature and density become the same throughout the lake. Hayden Lake in northern Idaho is of special interest with its diverse biological and water quality characteristics. The lake is really of three different types. The south end is deep, clear, and low in nutrients and is oligotrophic. To the north, the water quality in some of the lake's bays is not as clear as in the southern end. These bay areas have well-developed submergent plant communities that are more characteristic of a mesotrophic lake. The extreme north end of Hayden with high nutrients, poor water clarity, and excessive submergent plants is highly eutrophic. Variations in cover, food, and living space associated with Hayden Lake's diverse water quality account for the variety of fish, aquatic plants, insects, and other organisms that make up the complex and highly productive food webs found in the lake. are experiencing unprecedented pressure from recreational users. Swimming, boating, fishing, and lakeshore development are impacting water quality in most of our lakes today. A heavily used recreational lake that has experienced extreme growth and development in the last decade is Lake Coeur d'Alene in northern Idaho. In the summer, the lake is one of the most congested and busiest in the state. Watershed management decisions for the Coeur d'Alene Basin are currently pending on political, economic, and environmental questions. Honest answers and real follow-through, as well as implementation of currently developing management plans, will have an unprecedented impact for the future of Coeur d'Alene Lake and the quality of life for citizens of the Coeur d'Alene area. These kinds of decision-making scenarios in managing our lakes and streams continue to occur throughout the world as population growth and competition for water environments are at an all-time high. It's time for more responsible and realistic long-term decisions and actions to be taken to implement sound management plans to protect our lakes, streams, and oceans. Both water quality and water quantity are major considerations in the management of lakes, streams, and their fisheries. Lakes and streams are the culmination of surface and groundwater flow. These freshwater ecosystems are constantly changing and are very dynamic.
The salmon and trout fisheries you've seen in this program depend on the water quality of lakes and streams. You've seen how land management activities affect fish and aquatic environments. This interdependency among living organisms and their environments is the basis of understanding the ecological dynamics of aquatic ecosystems. It's essential that we understand how these biological communities function and maintain themselves as healthy ecosystems. With this knowledge and the wisdom to protect our waters, we will be able to manage and preserve those magnificent salmon and trout and the lakes and streams they live in.